and welcome back to episode 18 of the Soul Enchilada. This is part two as Christine, Ruth, and I, Laura Bussey, talk about sex, baby, right? Christine, we're talking about sex. Yay. And if you missed episode seven, yay, part two. <laughs> if you missed episode 17, I would encourage you, even maybe stop right now, go back and listen to it. I promise you will laugh with us as we talk about sex and the whole enchilada. And Christine even reveals what night of the week is her sex night. Woo! That doesn't get people to go back. Oh, I don't know fantastic. what will. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. Uh, there's a teaser. Everyone wants to know that. Anyway, uh, Laura, okay, we're doing part two. I'm so excited. What is the question for today? Let's dive in. Let's dive in. The question is, my partner and I have a pretty disconnected or dull sex life. I grew up never talking about sex. How do I talk about it now? Mm. Welcome to our world, right? Uh, um, wow, I really appreciate this question. Like I appreciate all the questions, but I, you know, I really, I think if we could see all the women's hands going up uh, in relationship to this question, if I asked, you know, how many people here, Christian women, Jewish women, Muslim women, good girls, um, you know, however, whatever your religious tradition, I would imagine that many of us grew up in homes where sex was some sort of naughty word. It was definitely a naughty word in our home, or at least we perceived it that way. I think my parents would say, no, we would have been happy to talk about it. And they did, to their credit, they did talk about it later when we, it may be a little too late. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of women um, can relate to that question. So thank you, listener, for being bold enough to um, email that to us. Um, and of course, everyone, um, please feel free to email us your bold questions. Um, so, okay, great question. So why is it so hard? First of all, let's just talk about this. Why is it so hard to talk about sex, especially uh, for those of us who identify as with some sort of spiritual tradition, religious tradition? Um, you know, for me, um, identifying with Christianity, I grew up in a definitely what I would call a purity culture, um, a purity culture where, uh, there was incredible shame for women about, you know, having any sort of sexual desire. There was kind of this understanding that women don't have sexual desire and that's naughty and that you can't, you know, you obviously, at least we were taught you don't have sex before you get married. And, you know, because the average age of first marriage these days is 32, um, which is crazy. The average age of first marriage is 32. So you imagine all these women who are now delaying marriage because they're going off, um, yay, women, going off and getting their undergraduate degrees and their master's degrees, and then some of them their PhDs, and they're not getting married until 32, um, what does that mean to say we're going to, in a sense, suppress or get rid of or not have sex, um, and not connect with our sexual desire until we're 32 when we actually come of age now earlier. <laughs> so we have more sexual desire, um, now starting in fourth and fifth grade because when girls are developing more quickly. Um, so it just creates a dilemma. And what growing up, there was just so much shame about women even talking about it, right? Like you're just supposed to wait until you get married and don't talk about it. Because there was this sense of like, if you talk about it, it might happen. And so we combat 
having sex by just not talking about it. And then it will never be a thing. I, I mean, I think that that was the belief. What, I mean, how, how do you think about this, Laura? Did you grow up in a, in a culture of shame you know, related to sexuality, um, how was it talked about or not talked about in your house? Oh goodness. Um, we never talked about it. I mean, it never, it never came up. I think I learned about sex from my girlfriends, uh, from school, you know, basically I just asked questions or it just came up. People would assume you already knew, and then you could ask a question to get more information. <laughs> Um, I think mm -hmm. I grew up in a culture where if you did even sexually explore with, um, a boy, a young man, then you were considered a slut or a whore. Mm -hmm. And I, and I remember uh, my dad using that kind of language, uh, with me. So I didn't hear the, the boys were okay. Like it was okay for the boys to explore and the boys to be involved in sex. But if girls did, then they were sluts. And I was okay. talking to a girlfriend recently about how it just was silence. Again, that generational silence. We just didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't talk about it. And so somehow if you were sexually active, then shame was just put upon you. Like as if you're putting on a coat or putting on a, you know, mm -hmm. like the, it was just put on you as like the expectation. If you were sexually active, then it came with shame. And I'll never forget mm -hmm. reading Brene Brown's definition of shame. And it just resonated with my heart so much because I think it's how I felt a lot growing up. Let me read it to you. She writes, what is shame? Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. Hmm. And I just think that's what shame does. Shame separates us. It makes us think that we're unworthy of love. And it's absolutely the opposite of what God says, right? God is love. Mm -hmm. His love is unconditional. There's nothing we can do to make him love us more than he loves us right now. No matter what we've done or who we've become, God has seen it all and he still loves us. It just flies in the mm -hmm. face of our cultural shame. What does it bring it up? Mm -hmm. What what does this bring up for you, Christine? Yeah, I just appreciate you naming, uh, you know, I love Brene Brown's definition of shame. And I was just thinking about while you were talking, Laura, that, you know, first of all, shame prevents us from being able to talk about sex, which is really a shame, <laughs> as my grandma would say, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> um, right. Um, it's a shame that we can't talk about shame um, and, and we can't talk about sex because, of course, you know, Brene Brown also in her research talks about, you know, the best anecdote to shame um, is being able to talk about it. Right. Like I love the quote, the quotation uh, which is on my Princeton Family Counseling website, you know, shame dies when stories are told in safe places. Mm -hmm. You know, shame dies when stories are told in safe places, which I think Anne Voskamp wrote that. Um, and I think it's just so um, powerful uh, to talk about the things that we try to hide um, so we were, we didn't talk about sex because we were ashamed about it. And then the, uh, the other piece about that is that often young women, young girls feel pressured or pressure themselves to have sex or engage sexually when they don't feel ready because they're ashamed of not being loved for who they are. Right. So, so it's interesting because shame can stop us from engaging sexually or connecting with sexual desire or our erotic part, but it also can propel us to connect with it 
prematurely, right? Because there's a sense of, okay, I'm not worthy of love and belonging. And so some young girls, right, the average age of losing your virginity is 15 now. Mm -hmm. And so some young girls feel like, you know, okay, he's not going to like me unless, unless I'm willing to hook up. And uh, we'll have to interview our daughters on this sometime, Laura, because it's just so amazing to me about the pressure that uh, teenagers and young adults are under to engage in hookup culture. And, you know, as my daughter says, oh, mom, they're not dating. They're just a thing. And if you're just a thing, that could mean that you're having sex, but you're not dating because once you're dating, you're in a monogamous relationship, maybe. Um, but just a lot of couples are just a thing. They're just a thing. And so there's incredible pressure to kind of try out the bike before you buy it um, or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, and that's that's another form. Uh, that's another way that shame shows up uh, for young people and for women is feeling like, okay, I have to, in a sense, put out in order to get this guy to like me. Um, and I know there's been incredible pressure on some of my clients, my, my college age clients that are like, I'm not ready to move in that way with this guy. We don't have an emotional connection. And I always say to um, young people, and I, don't, I know we don't wanna get off on this, but I always say to young people, if you can't talk about sex and you can't talk about sexual desire and sexual boundaries, you're not ready to be having it. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And so like, we should be able to talk about it so that it does, it's not so shame driven. Right. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead, Laura, you're inhaling. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, I'm so glad you brought up that quote that shame dies when stories are shared in safe places. And I think I would encourage this, the woman who asked the question and all of us, to share our stories. And so I'll go first. I'll be brave. Um, I'll never forget the- Wow. <laughs> um, I'll never okay, forget- Remember, the Laura, this is international. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. Keep going. Oh, Just no, I'm feeling that. shame. I should share. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Keep going. Keep going. No, um, I live in a college town uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and my kids- elementary school is right near the hill of University of Colorado. And I'll never forget, I was taking my kids one day to school in the morning on a Friday. And there was a girl walking up the sidewalk with her last night's dress on and her high heel mm. shoes in her hands. And everything inside of me wanted to pull the car over and be like, hey, get in, get in. Um, I couldn't make eye contact with her because her eyes were fixed on the ground and her entire mm. body language was, I am ashamed of what I did last night. And I, I mm. wanted to, you know, pull her in the car and be like, oh, honey, there's so many of us in the generation ahead of you that have walked <laughs> that road of shame. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't help you to hold on to shame and it doesn't help you if you reenact and you rethink and you, you just perseverate on that shame and that night and what you did. You really have to shake that shame off and see yourselves as the way God sees you as blameless and learn from that experience and that I've learned over time that guilt and shame are very different. Like we can feel guilt mm -hmm. in that moment of that walk of shame where, you know, she's still wearing the cocktail dress. I remember it was purple, purple cocktail dress, and it was all crinkled mm. and wrinkled. And it reminded me of my college years where I had, like I was on one foot, I was the good girl. And on the other foot, I was the party girl. Mm. And so when the party girl would take mm -hmm. over and the party girl would get going, you know, I, I had some walks mm -hmm. of shame and I've shared that with, mm -hmm. with my daughters and I've shared that with my friends and it opens the door then to say, you know, I, 
I held on to shame for a long time. And shame tells Mm -hmm. us that we are bad. We are wrong. We are, something's wrong with us. Where guilt says, I did Mm -hmm. something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I I did Mm -hmm. something wrong and I can learn from that experience. I don't want to walk that road of shame anymore. I want to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. I want to live a life of integrity. I want to know who I am and what my values are. But I think when I share that walk of shame story with friends or younger people, it gives them permission to say, wow, yeah, I guess I have been locked up in shame for a while. And what does it look like to take off that coat, take off that party Mm -hmm. dress, you know, take off that shame Mm -hmm. and put on a true identity of who we are Mm -hmm. in faith and also in therapy, right? So God says that we are Mm -hmm. forgiven and we are adopted and we're Mm -hmm. blessed and we're chosen and we're loved. We're loved for who we Mm -hmm. are, even when we make a mistake. And so I just share that with you because maybe there'll be some other brave Mm -hmm moms or brave friends who are willing to talk about their walks of shame and step into the light Mm -hmm. and say, shame no more. I'm going to be who God made me to be. I'm going to be my true self. That's right. That's right. And I love, you know, Laura, thank you for being so vulnerable as always. Um, And I really appreciate that you talk about living what we call the split self, like we all have a split self. Maybe you had a party Laura part and you had a, you know, good girl Christian part. Um, I did. I had a, a party Christine part and I had a good girl uh, part that was like the head of my youth group and super active at church. And unfortunately, those parts didn't get to be in conversation Um, You know, I believe that God created us to be sensual beings. God gave us a clitoris. God gave us the ability to have orgasms. Am I allowed to say that on this? Um, You just did. God created us that way. God created us that that way. So we have a God that that created our bodies for pleasure, um, which is so awesome. And we don't talk about that enough. We don't talk in, about enough the fact that God didn't have to do that. If God wanted us to just make babies, it didn't. It wouldn't have had to have had any sort of pleasure involved. But God created our bodies to have pleasure. So I think it's important for us to develop a relationship with the part of us that likes to party. Maybe that's extroverted, and I don't know what party, quote unquote, means to you, Laura, or to all of our listeners out there. But, you know, we create, we have a God, we serve a God that turned water into wine and and liked to have a party. You know, God, Jesus, at least the, the, the God I identify with, loved to have a party. And if he didn't like having parties, that wouldn't have been his first miracle in the Gospel of Mark. And so, you know, there's, God created our partying parts. God created parts that, um, that are erotic and sensual. And that's why we have, you know, we have Song of Solomon where there's kind of this interplay between a couple, um, seeking their, the erotic, um, their desire. And, uh, I think that that's, you know, and God also created these, Parts that we identify with as, I don't know, the good girl parts, the parts that want to, I mean, I think there's a positive intent in our good girl parts. They're the parts that want to people please and to want to please God or want to please mom and dad or want to please, um, you know, a sense of integrity or, you know, want to uh, honor our own sense of ethics. God created those parts too. And so I think, you know, the key is to put those parts in conversation and get to know all the parts, because if we don't get to know our erotic parts, if we only get to know the good girl parts, our people pleasing parts or our perfectionist parts, or if we only get to know the partying parts, then the erotic parts hide in the shadows. Mm. And then what happens when we try to repress a part or we try to ignore it or we say, oh, you are not allowed to be erotic. You're not allowed to have sexual desire 
is that part will blindside you and hijack the system when you are least expecting it. Right. I mean, that sounds really doom and gloom, but you know, that's, you know, a part of you and it's important to bring that part into the light to get to know it and go, what are my sexual desires? What does turn me on? Um, you know, how do I want my partner to seduce me? What does make me feel erotic? Uh, what are my sexual longings? Who who am I when I'm feeling free and connected? And what would I like to explore sexually? These are these are questions that we don't ask because we have too much shame. And if we don't ask the questions, then we can't communicate to our our partners and tell them, you know, what we want and need. And if we can't tell them what we want and need, it, our sex sex lives are going to be very disconnected and dissociated and weird and disorienting, right? That's fantastic. I mean, you just gave our listener, and we'll make sure to put some of these questions in the show notes, but you just gave her the questions that she could ask her husband, right? Mm. She could go mm -hmm. first and say, "Hun, I have some questions I want to ask you about your sexual longings, your sexual desires, your sexual exploration. And then it's going to turn around and help her explore her own. Uh, I love that. I love mm -hmm. that. Hey, I want to go back real quick. You said something about if we have our erotic parts hidden in the shadows, then at some point they're going to hijack the system. Can you give us an example of what you're talking about? Because to me, that sounds a lot like therapy and my brain went, what, what, oh. what? No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So the way we think about parts is that if we don't invite parts to the table, parts of us to, um, to the table, imagine inside of you, there's a, 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 a dining room table and you want to invite all your parts to the table to be in dialogue. Um, if we don't invite parts, say we've talked about this in other contexts, say we have an angry part and we suppress that because we're like, oh no, good girls don't get angry. Or we have a sad part that's grieving and we go, oh no, I'm not going to grieve because it takes too long and I'm just going to jump into acceptance. Or, I'm, or I have an erotic part and I'm not going to engage that part because, ooh, that feels naughty. Um, then those parts um, take go to extreme lengths to express themselves. Um, and they, they engage in extreme behavior. That's what I mean about hijacking the, the system. So for instance, I work with a lot of young Christian couples who don't talk about sex, who keep their sexuality in the shadows. And then they do these crazy things when they drink too much or make really poor decisions when they're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired right? HALT, that's the acronym HALT we've talked about before. When we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, suddenly that part is going to hijack the system and say, I get to have my way, right? So if we say to our erotic part, you are not allowed. I'm, I am not erotic. I don't have sexual desire. I'm not going to explore my sexual desires. That part is going to come out, for instance, in an addiction to pornography. Or that part might come out in um, acting out in ways that we don't want our parts to act out. Um, and, and our parts sometimes show, show up in our dreams. And that's not a bad thing. Um, our dreams are often our way, our, our unconscious, unconscious's way of showing us things that we're repressing or um, not acknowledging or things in our shadows. So they're going to come out some way um, as a way of saying, hey, pay attention to me. I want to be a part of your life. I'm part of you. God made you to be sexual and to have desire and to have eros. So pay attention to me and get to know me so that you, in a sense, can channel the river in a, in a helpful, healthy way. And it doesn't take you off course, right? So that you've drank too much and now suddenly your erotic parts are texting women at night or getting, going on apps and hooking up with people when you don't really want to be doing that. Right. 
Um, because, but that's what erotic parts will do if we don't give them space. I'm so glad you clarified that because it went from, I, I went from a place of fuzziness to clarity. I, I really appreciate that. In closing, you brought up our bodies and the way God has made us, made us with a clitoris. Is there a book that you would recommend that women might want to read with their husbands or with a book group that might help us explore, get in touch with our erotic parts? Does something come to your mind? Oh, yeah. Um, I love, so we don't have enough Christian, Jewish, Muslim books on this issue, which by the way, I'm hoping to write that book. I want more, um, but we don't, we don't have them um, as much as I'd like. I love Rob Bell's book, Sex God. I love his exploration of this. I love the book by Emily Nagoski, um, Come As You Are. Um, Come As You Are is a great way, you know, a guide to the science of sex a great resource for women um, to help start reconnecting to their sex lives. Um, I highly recommend Esther Perel, whether you agree with her or not, she's kind of uh, can be out there for some people, but I love her. Um, She has uh, great resources on her site, um, especially sexuality conversation starters to help couples start exploring their sexuality. So that's a lot of resources, but uh, Sex God by Rob Bell, Sexuality Conversation Starters by Esther Perel, who's written several books and has great TED Talks on discovering your erotic parts mm-hmm. um, and creating erotic intelligence. And then Emily Nagoski, um, Come As You Are, uh, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life. Thank you, Amazon, who showed up for me at the last minute so I could remember those titles. I know you weren't, I wasn't planning on asking you, but I thought I was just channeling all these women that are listening to this going, give me more, give me more, give me more. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Exactly. We are out of time. Sex part Thank two. You, Laura. Thank you, Christine. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Such a great conversation. Uh, can't wait for the next one. And that, my friends, is episode 18 of Soul in July.